into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. PDA, Jake Flores, Alex Patak, Anders Lee. Here. Uh, Present. Back in black. Remember that segment from the Craig Kilborn Daily Show where Lewis Black would come on and he'd go, I'm going to talk about the stories that's, that's not his voice at all, that slipped th- through the crack. Is that closer? Um, yeah. Wait, he was on the Craig Kilborn version? He was on the original ass Daily Show. I used to watch that when I was like a child. I was like a nerdy Anders Lee kid to some extent and watched like the Daily Show with fucking Craig Kilborn before they even wow. brought on Jon Stewart. And uh, fucking, yeah, the, the, I, th- I think before they even brought on Jon Stewart, if I'm remembering this correctly, Lewis Black was like a fixture on the fucking show because he would do this segment really? called Back in Black where his thing was the stories that slipped through the crack. And then he would just yell about, you know, some shit that happened. Was he allowed to curse on that? Because that's kind of like his whole angle. They must have believed it, right? Yeah. I mean, he. I think that he doesn't actually curse that much as much as he does like the Eddie Pepitone, like, I'm talking quiet. And then I'm talking loud. <laughs> and then I'm talking quiet. And then, uh, uh, you know. And just, That's these are the stories you missed. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> what I what I've heard about the Kilborn era is that it was like a less topical weekend update. Like they wouldn't really touch any issues of the day. It was just kind of like fake stories that happened. And like the this person in Sacramento has a uh, is wearing a goose for pants or something like that. Yeah. Uh, just like really wacky stuff. And so That's maybe wacky. Lewis Black was like the only sort of political content they had. Well, you know, I uh, think what happened is, and this is actually kind of like, it all makes sense. We look at a big picture, you know, so you and I, Anders, we've both been watching this Harley Quinn show on HBO um, you watch it and you go, holy shit, this show's actually pretty good. How did they make a show like this funny and kind of creative? And it's like, but it's like a DC property. It's all like, like it's animated, like a fucking full on mass produced comic book cartoon thing. And the answer to that is, uh, like when something in American entertainment doesn't have that much money riding on it, it's not like a blockbuster you're able to get creative. So this happened with like Guardians of the Galaxy, which is why that movie was better than other superhero movies because they didn't think it was going to be a big blockbuster movie, so they let the writers kind of get creative with it. But then this thing happens where that itself creates like a following because it's original and then the thing gets watered down. So like the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie was worse. The next season of this Harley Quinn show will probably be worse if it becomes huge, you know? <laughs> um, True. So here's what I'm saying. The Daily Show started off on like cable TV on Comedy Central, which was a very small rinky dink thing when it first started. It had like three things. It had like Dr. Katz, this weird version of The Daily Show. Um, and I think that like the stand up culture around New York or whatever the fuck, whoever, you know, producer wise went into the original mix of like where that show came from. I think they were able to operate and be kind of subversive because it was a comedy show. And so it didn't really matter what they were saying. And then eventually it grew into like this thing that a generation of people watched, like instead of the news and stuff. Right. And that's when it became really like kind of spineless and toothless and, uh, and ruthless and ruthless. Well, yeah, not to pick on Trevor Noah, uh, as a you know solo show artist myself, but uh, I think that was really the big shift is when he came in and and it it was still a political show, but it I think got much less critical um, of the of the status quo, frankly. But but I, I just remember like you know being in in high school and this is I this makes me sound really old. No, I'm thinking of it, but uh, no, my no. our computer at home didn't have the 
um, internet speed to watch episodes of The Daily Show on it. Like our our wi- or our broadband was just too shitty, so I would have to go to the library, the public library uh, in downtown St. Paul, like on my you know off hour in, in senior year of high school, and like watch it on the library computer next to like a bunch of homeless people watching porn. Uh, <laughs> just, it's the, the way it was intended to be viewed. Yeah. I just remember when he had on Jim Cramer right after like the financial crisis in 2008, just like cheering in this library, like, fuck yeah. Like, cause no one on the news was actually holding these people accountable, you know? Um, or, or they did very briefly. And then you could tell, Someone at on some level was like, "Yeah, this is too much. We got to quell it down." Like you remember the? I'm gonna have to ask you to stop holding us accountable. <laughs> well, you remember like <laughs> the bonus, the bonus controversy, right? Like when right after the financial crisis, everybody on Wall Street was getting bonuses after they're being bailed out, and it was just yeah. huge. Ever so right. much outrage, like bipartisan outrage. Uh, Chuck Grassley was saying they should kill themselves. <laughs> And then mm. after that, they just stopped talking about it on on network news. They're like, "Ooh, this this is a little too dicey here." Uh, but the, the Daily Show was the only one of the only platforms, other than like you know, uh, Democracy Now and other grassroots media, who are like actually talking about this stuff. Um, so yeah, no for respect. <laughs> but I think that's also I guess maybe I would go that's why John Stewart uh, couldn't take it anymore he lost his mind because it was too too much pressure once he was famous and yet still trying to, to to talk about shit like that against all the pressure not to right then he fucking he bounces and Trevor Noah comes in and goes I'll do a cucked version of the Daily Show no big deal you know yeah well, that I was his pitch he, too I think Stewart I would do is ultimately cuck- like a lib like the right. the shit he was saying back then, like I think he genuinely believed, but he just didn't have anywhere to go with it. It was like this is Wall Street as an institution is not living up to uh, what it's meant to be doing. You know, the government, uh, our Congress is not living up to the standards set by the founding fathers. He was like trying to get people to, um, you, you know, meet the the standard that was enshrined in the constitution and in our institutions uh, without realizing that it's the problem is the institutions themselves. Liberal with Congress, but now he's just liberal with his wife getting cucked. That's right. Um, All right. Well, from here to Timbuktu, this guy's getting (laughs) cucked. My God. He's getting cucked. That's uh, (laughs) the Lewis Black shaking his jowls around. Is this uh, what an yeah. uncanny impression? Back in black. Here's a bunch of shit that happened this week while we were talking about mutual aid and uh, other stuff. Um, Nazis. So Seth Simons wrote this article about how uh, the guy who owns the stand, one of them, is basically as much as, but not entirely linked to like right up until you, he can't legally kind of make the connection, I think in the article, but it's pretty clear that Chris Italia, one of the owners of the stand is, uh, he's just this like user on this fucking, you know, Nazi ass, like, uh, message board where he says all the things that he like wants to say. And so he's an old internet, like cringe guy. He, his old, um, like company that they turned into the stand is called cringe humor, which is like shit you do on reddits where you are obsessed with people like me. Um, so expose, you know, comes out, it pisses off all the, our fucking friends at the skanks and all those people and shit. And, uh, it was really funny because that guy, Chris Italia is like really pissed off about it. I woke up, somebody sent it to me. I retweeted it. I was like, cool. I read it, you know? Um, and then within minutes, he's like up in my replies and he's like, Hey, fuck you. Uh, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, you know, he's telling me like, uh, you've been on the stage here at the stand. Are you a Nazi? And I was like, I have not been on the stage because the one time I was booked, your one of your fucking comics attacked me and pushed my friend Louisa and spit in my face. And, uh, he runs a Nazi podcast. So, you know, <laughs> um, quid pro quo. Yeah. 
so this guy spent like literally like all day, like five hours just in my replies arguing with me and Louisa and like uh, saying his new thing is that I, he was he was going to respect my, uh, you know, <laughs> when I came in to talk to him about his thing that happened. I was on bar. the verge of respecting. Him. <laughs> but I was just about to do it. The <laughs> respect meter was right. In the, do you remember that there was a Sopranos computer game that had a respect meter? And the, the goal of the game was to earn 100% on the respect of me. Oh, it's just like real life. Rodney Dangerfield yeah. playing it. And, yeah. and more and more. I don't know. Okay. so But so he was like, well, I, you know, what happened is Lewis attacked me at his club. I showed up. Just to recap for anyone who's not been with the show this long, a long time ago, the guy from Legion of Skanks, Lewis Gomez, uh, got mad at me for making fun of him on the internet for being a fucking dumbass Nazi sympathizer guy. And, uh, so he waited till I had a show at this club that he works at called The Stand, which is now we know is run by, you know, these guys who are really online, just Reddit, alt-right guys or whatever. So if nothing else, they're definitely mods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Lewis came to the, this show I was at. I didn't know him really. So I was just putting my shit down, my bag and stuff, getting ready to go on stage to do a spot. And this guy comes up to me and he's like red in the face, like when you're really, really pissed off, like his eyes are tearing up and stuff. And he's like, hey, you know, you, what the fuck? You think you could say shit to me online or whatever? I didn't know who it was. I figured out, oh, it's this guy I've been making fun of, Luis Gomez. And uh, I, I was like... You know, I, I have to do a set. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to walk over here and do a set. And he started pushing me and my friend Louisa that I was with who booked the show. And he pushed her. And he spit on me. And I was like, you're in a bar. Like, you're trying to get me to take a swing at you so that you can be legally protected and take a swing back at me. So, like, I'm not going to do that. And, um... You know, and then the the but the bar itself, I it, it's, I work in bars, so the reason I did this is because I know how this works, and I was trying to defer to the venue to go like, hey, this one guy started a fight, leave. But I didn't realize at the time the venue was run by these people, so they were like, hey, everyone, get this guy, like at me, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so you know this whole thing happened. It kicked me out. I went, wow, that was fucking weird. The venue turned on me for trying to like respect their fucking bar. Me and Louisa had a meeting afterwards, or like a, a day or two later, with this guy Chris Italia, and he said uh, he's now saying this is over a year later, and he's now saying the reason that he told us to fuck off in this meeting essentially is because I was drunk and high, and like, and for one thing, I wasn't. It was like two in the afternoon. Um, it's a big no no at uh, at the stand. For another thing, you run a comedy club. <laughs> Everyone's drunk and high. Like, what do you? Fucking Tommy Chong is working there next month or some shit. Like, <laughs> it's as av- it's a bar. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and uh, and also eventually he goes, he's like, well, you're saying curse words. I keep calling him a bitch, and he's like, wow, disrespectful. But this is the Nazi comedy club. <laughs> so uh, yeah, anyone that's been playing along on Twitter, that's kind of the back round of what's going on here. He has since locked his account because I think he lawyered up. I told him while it was happening, like. You, your lawyer is going to tell you to delete all this stuff, uh, and he's now he's a he's, you know these account this these tweets are protected on Twitter mm. or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. Seth Simon's controversial writer. He certainly hates comedians to a personal degree, but um, <laughs> d- bang up j- fucking reporting in my opinion in that piece at least. Uh, it's very Anthony funny. Anthony Jeselnik shared it. Anthony Jeselnik shared it, and then in the replies, Big J Okerson from the Legion of Skanks was like, "But did you read it? Because <laughs> 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 yeah, he's implicated in it." Ah. Was it one of those things where it's just like, this is a thing. I have no opinion on it. Like, how did he? He just slammed that button. He okay. just, which is the most supportive thing you can do. He just retweeted it. Internet but at arts, slammed the button. Apparently, he's been talking about like Seth's Substack on his podcast, so he's like a fan. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, all I all I'll say is I, I'm just happy for Luis J. Gomez, the uh, Puerto Rican rattlesnake that. I was not there, the the Norwegian chairman, because <laughs> there would have been a serious blow to the tricep on uh, on Mr. Gomez that would have uh, sent him, you know, shaking shaking away in, in, in terror. I would have sent you upstream, pal. <laughs> <laughs> the salmon. It's a new, much less popular branch of the UFC. <laughs> 
<laughs> podcasters taking swipes at each other. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I mean, my I... favorite part of this article, I only I only uh, saw this one thing. Uh, Justy Dodge, who is just a like comedian we know, who is not at by any means a famous person of any kind, <laughs> is mentioned in the article. I think just to fill out like a list of names. You know how when you're making a list and you're like, and Big J Okerson was there, and uh, and uh, Micah Brucey, and it, it, yeah, it said Justy Dodge, but the sentence for it is like mainstream players associating with Nazis, like Justy Dodge, and she's like, "Why am I in this?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a few people that he just threw in, and I I talked to him about it, and he said that the reason he threw them in is to exp- to display that this stuff is so pervasive. But I think that that was wildly irresponsible because, like, you should probably point out like that that's the reason why you're naming people that just happen yeah. to walk through the club and go, "What the fuck this is a Nazi club?" Uh, Extra I mean, sentence may- being like, and people who are not Nazis, such as. <laughs> I mean, maybe he yeah. did it just to make sure they get the credit, right? She she wants to be able to have Credits the new republic. So important, yeah, yeah, in especially this industry that I have not participated in for a year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now more <laughs> than ever. Disclaimer: Justy Dodge is not a Nazi. Yeah, no, like, neither is Lori Kilmartin or Dave Hill. I don't think, but um, but all the rest of those motherfuckers are. Um, you know, to the to, it's complicated, but uh, the platform Known people and their Dave fucking Hill hacks from Adult Swim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So, uh, anyway, yeah, if you want to hear more about that, we talked about it on Why You Mad to some extent. Um, back in black, next thing, uh, Super Bowl happened, burner, it was pretty boring. What you guys think? Super Bowl, not a great game. Uh, I lost $200. <laughs> uh, but I'm probably, I don't know. I, I, I still am going to try and win it back somehow. Uh, I, I've, I've been, it's been explained to me that it doesn't work that way, but I, I still believe in myself and my betting abilities. I went with, I made the mistake of going with my own personal bias, um, which is oh, I try to mistake. not. Yeah. I should have seen it coming. I should have seen Brady coming on that. But I think the problem is Mahomes uh, didn't get his haircut. Did you guys hear about this? The, the Chiefs barber um, was like in the middle of shaving this guy's head on the Chiefs. And then his, a COVID test came in and was like, oh, you're positive. So he's like, oh, we got to wrap this up. I'm sorry. And half the guy's head was shaved and the other half was not. Whoa, uh, that. Yeah. And so Mahomes, he, the QB, didn't look. even – Right. The, Q- the QB didn't even get his haircut. So that, you know, he interferes kept with the leaping vision. onto the ground before he would throw the ball. Which kept, from a what? strategy standpoint, he would throw himself on the ground and then throw the ball midair, which did I look mean, cool. So Those <laughs> plays were so close to being great, though. Like, if the way he was... The problem was... This is... I'm putting on a little uh, football analyst hat. They had some... Is it a helmet? Uh, no, it's just the it's just a hat that connects to uh, brainstem. Uh, what color is it? Red. Both teams okay. are red, and that's another problem with this year's Super Bowl. Like last year, two red teams. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, the offensive line on the Chiefs had some injuries, uh, which I didn't think would make that big of a difference because their quarterback Patrick Mahomes is a scrambler. He's a very fast guy. He can get away from the defense, but the like one second that the offensive line would have usually been able to afford him made a huge amount of difference because like that one second gives him a chance to sort of look down the field and decide where he's going with the play. And he didn't have that second. So he had to just go into scrambling and trying to make things happen on his own. And he still came very close to making some incredible plays, but there just was that small amount of a uh, lack of protection that I think did it for him. Yeah, it was nerve wracking because there were plays that would have just kind of gotten him out of the hole and made it less of a fucking terrible beat or whatever. You know what I didn't realize going into this because I don't follow any of this shit is uh, we were trying to figure out like what's the narrative, who's the underdog and stuff like that and who's the cool uh-huh. team. In retrospect, Mahomes was like a cool guy to root for. I didn't realize because I don't watch sports and don't didn't know who he was until kind of after the fact. He's like a quarter black. He's like an atmosphere, you know, the guy from Atmosphere? Like a... Slug. Huh? Slug? 
Yeah, he looks like Slug. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I know enough about football to know like the kind of weird stigma around black quarterbacks and stuff like that. He's kind of like the Slug of football. He's like the Slug of football. <laughs> Sean way, likes ugly girls of football. <laughs> Who's and that guy's from Minneapolis, therefore we should have rooted for him because that's uh, where Andrews is from. Right, yeah, that's well, where Andrews is from, and that's how this game works. Yes, his his father, as you mentioned. Last episode was um, a Twins pitcher, so for that I, I rooted for him, along with the the racial aspect. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. He could have been doing <laughs> backpack raps out there on the field, you know, <laughs> with Aesop Rock and shit. Um, I've been rooting for you racially. <laughs> Who's that? Can you feel my support? <laughs> Anders Lee here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Um, Super Britney Bowl. Spears is in the news. Britney Spears. Let's talk about that. Andrews, you watched the documentary, right? Yeah, it was really good. It um, has some things that I didn't know uh, that a lot of people didn't know about. Uh, a thing I didn't even really know that much uh, that it even existed, really. Uh, conservatorship. Are you guys familiar? I don't know nearly enough. I don't know what that is. So, basically, uh, I mean, it is partially a biopic, uh, which I enjoyed, you know. uh, Speaking of race, this might get me in some trouble, but uh, the first time... Make sure you say it. (laughs) It's probably important. (laughs) (laughs) The first time, I remember, and I was, I I recalled this during the documentary, the first time I ever heard Britney Spears... uh, when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, I thought she was African American. I don't know what that's <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, her or me. Uh, <laughs> very important that this is included in the episode. If she was on a football team, I would ride root for her. Yeah, I would want her to be QB. <laughs> She's actually uh, Maltese, like Pete Buttigieg. Really? Yeah. They're okay. Both that there you really go. Specific. They, they stay winning. I mean, the Maltes Moors stay winning. The Moors, like, uh, you know, populated that area at so, a certain point. So maybe there is. Some of that. Uh, I admit this is not the angle I thought the Britney Spears discussion was going to take, but I okay. like it. Uh, well, it does have to do with bondage. Um, Whoa, which <laughs> is a bad thing and something we should oppose as socialists. So basically, uh, she had her crisis period in like the late aughts. Do you guys remember that when she shaved her head? Oh and yeah, yeah. She was hit awesome. a car with an umbrella. That was a hard time for me when Britney was doing that. <laughs> yeah, it was a hard time for everybody. Wait, we all remember the video that Alex made, Leave Britney Alone. That was him. <laughs> yeah, that was my first <laughs> big podcast. Yeah, that was the thing that went viral that made us you know, have a following. Right. <laughs> but, like, so those two things apparently uh, were used to deem her mentally unstable. Just her head shaving and the umbrella... Um, whacking and because of that her assets were put in control of her father jamie spears who and this is the was the strangest part to me her dad's name is jamie her mom's name is lynn and her sister's name is jamie lynn what you (laughs) what a circus of freaks (laughs) (laughs) like if my name was Don Nan Lee. Nan Dong Lee. I don't know. Um, it would be like if my name was Nan Dong Lee. <laughs> yeah, but Don. My dad's name is not Dong. It's 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 Don. Not but, what uh, I heard. <laughs> not what I heard just now, based on the thing I just made up. <laughs> but anyway, so she can't control any of her... She has no control, basically, over her career, over her financial decisions or her legal decision making so she gets if she gets an attorney they make the argument like oh you you don't actually get to have this attorney because in theory you're not capable of retaining counsel um so it has to be a court appointed attorney uh she's just been deemed like mentally defective basically it's like an old school eugen it's like how i would be treated in 1910 you know um which is fucked up. 
because like yeah, again, I don't know what she I don't know what she supposedly did. It was she she freaked out. I mean, I don't the head shaving thing is not like illegal. There's nothing there that uh, people do that all the time now. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. And then I guess she kind of like acted out on on somebody's car. She went hang on somebody's car when she was being harassed by paparazzi. That's not enough to to say somebody is insane. Yeah, like, is Blanca from Street Fighter insane? Maybe bad example. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> you but couldn't anyway. get a, a court in the world to convict convict Blanca on charges of insanity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now there is this big movement to free Britney from her conservatorship and she's been giving like so they were seen as sort of conspiracy theorists uh, a little over a year ago and then they've been getting hint by hint by hint that she does want a new arrangement that she doesn't want to be under the yoke of her father Um, and through her Instagram which is an interesting thing too because that's sort of the, the the whole advent of Instagram sort of led to the decline of the paparazzi, right? So right, she that's gets like to, Facebook for pictures. Uh huh. Yeah, she gets to control the narrative, control the images that are going out in the world. Um, but at first, it was like, oh, this just seems crazy, right? You're you're reading into you're making up conspiracy theories, but but no, there's there's some pretty hard evidence that uh, she wants out, including just now from her son. Jaden Federline, also a son of KFED, who ripped into... This is so complicated. Shout outs. It's like a Bible. <laughs> uh, he ripped into his grandfather, Jamie Spears, on her Instagram live rant. And a follower is like ranting about how fucked up his granddad is. And then a follower on the Instagram chat says, kill your grandfather. And he's like, <laughs> bro, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Let me just say into this camera that will be on the internet. I plan on doing that. Yeah, which would be I don't. I'm not saying he should not do it, but but imagine how cool that would be if they made a movie about that. It's like a Punisher style thing. He goes in guns blazing to free his mom from like a Hollywood mansion. Just an idea. I think that'd be tight. Punisher Kevin Federline. Yeah. Punishing Jaden Federline. K Fed is out of the picture. Yeah, I don't think he really. Come on, man. Get K Fed back in the picture. Yeah, no, it's not K Fed anymore. It's J Fed. J Fed. K Fed is out, you know, lobbying for the penny. That's as far as I know, that's his last major activity is he was hired by the penny lobby, by the copper lobby to. Uh, stop them from eliminating the penny from American currency. I feel like I, what the wait, fuck did really? you just say to me? <laughs> <laughs> I feel hey, like I know true. somebody that knows him. Like he, oh, yeah. he fell hard enough to where he's in like my circles. Nice. He's nice. yeah. He's at the stand. He's um, hanging out there. K Fed, if you're listening, or or J Fed, come on the show. Okay. We want to talk. We want to talk backup dancing. We want to talk beautiful ladies and loving them. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have... But, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I honestly think that, if, especially if there are more, like, demonstrations, that the... I, I don't think the socialist movement has anything to lose here by sort of taking up the cause of Free Britney and ending conservatorship because it's, it affects a lot more people. I, I have 100% behind it that's that's what this campaign's all about i didn't even know that was a thing until now um cool all right well i think we have time for probably one more rapid fire uh back in black topic so uh what do you guys want to talk about antifa sluts uh with drugs in their vaginas that's a conspiracy theory about the capital riots that's coming out of the right-wing world it's pretty fun we can talk about uh rb hammer being a cannibal um, Brooklyn Dad Defiant, that guy from Twitter yelling at Phoebe Bridgers. Uh, I want to hear about that one. I haven't heard about that. 
this okay so one of the big stars of like donald trump reply guy twitter this guy brooklyn dad defiant he's fucking obnoxious but like if you if i talk to somebody i went to high school with and i look at their like twitter feed they're all like well this guy's great because he just he you know that's he's so defiant that's a whole industry just being a social media account that's like uh nasty women you know bad ombre or whatever and uh right he's like a particularly (laughs) bad one well, he just out of nowhere was watching Saturday Night Live the other day, and I guess Phoebe Bridgers is a guest on it, and she or she's the musical guest. And at the end of her song, she starts breaking her guitar over like a monitor, and uh, he just like tweeted it, a video of it, and he was just like, "This is disgusting." Let me see if I can find it. Um, One does not simply break a guitar. <laughs> you can't play any more beautiful songs on it afterwards. Yeah. Phoebe Bridgers. It was just fucking sucked. Well, this is you guys feel old shooting. that people are breaking guitars and getting in trouble for it, or or what? What? No, I, mean, I just don't know who Phoebe Bridgers is. <laughs> I mean, she's a songwriter. She, yeah, she's fine. I don't understand. Music that's coming out today to me is just like very boring. It's not like oh my brain, like. uh you know, like when it's weird, like a hundred gecks or something like that, I understand it. But there's a lot of just singer songwriter shit that Zoomers listen to, and I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. Shouldn't you? Nobody's be... Nobody's making any more songs where they tell you just to look at a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want more of. I mean, I like what I've heard of her, uh, but my taste is, you know, a little. I'd like, you know, Big Thief and that Sharon Van and that kind of shit. Uh, he said, why did this woman, Phoebe Bridgers, destroy her guitar on SNL? I mean, I didn't care much for the song either, but that seemed extra. And it's just weird because this guy's like in his <laughs> – the first thing in his bio is like feminist, but he's so mad at this thing. And, Hashtag uh, extra. He also was like calling the cops on people during like the Black Lives Matter stuff for like breaking windows and shit. So he's oh, just really? a dickhead. Yeah, he's Fuck, a fuck. I didn't know that part. He was Jesus. like tweeting about it. Like, I hope the police lock you up and shit. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. I hope you never get out. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm being defiant. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was doing it in that liberal way where it's like, you're making the real protesters who are protesting like dr king you're making them look bad and you you know making it where i have to call the cops on you and all this crazy shit right um but i guess to me the the weird part of this story is if you watch the video of phoebe bridgers she does not smash the guitar very well it doesn't even break so it's it's extra layered. Like it's not even a good thing to be mad about if that is your cause. You know, if you're a guitar. Is it sexist defender. to be to to hold ladies accountable for smashing guitars? Good. <laughs> well, they she... famously are missing those muscles, the guitar smashing muscles. Yeah. <sighs> did she eventually get it though, or uh, was it just? Well, sort it, of... it definitely breaks. It's like smoking. No, oh, you watched it. But she's doing like an overhead chair, like tree chop axe swing to smash it like the clash uh-huh. which is going to put you at a disadvantage if you have weaker shoulder muscles why not do a chun li style guitar smash put it on the ground and then axe kick it into the monitor or something very cool yeah I mean, why not break it like blanca curl up in a ball and then leap onto it smashing it with your thorny backside well if you were blanca you could it's an electric guitar you could blanca an electric guitar if you like i mean i think the part people are missing from this whole conversation is the guitar was drunk and high oh yeah no. <laughs> high well, we called the guitar to the meeting Marijuana. we just wanted to work it out yeah, I'm just going to throw this out there. Everybody who knows me from comedy knows I don't smoke weed because everyone smokes weed after comedy shows. And I'm always like, no, I don't. Like, I can't do that and do comedy. Like, it just, I don't like the drug. So the fact that he kept insisting that I was like, hi on Reefa. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> like, so clearly just trying to reach for something to make him not look like a complete asshole. You're just mad because you were high on Reefer. All right. I'm so you had mad. the green rage. I'm I'm so full of the green rage. You can call me Blanca <laughs> from Street Fighter. I'm so full <laughs> of the green rage. That's a good Blanca impression. They gave him the same voice as Muzzy from Muzzy. <laughs> That's we, something I've noticed. 
<laughs> we have to start yeah. the show. Um, the uh, pod, Fair enough. the interview this week is with our friends Andy uh, Gitlitz and Matt Peterson from Woodbine, the uh, mutual aid collective here in, well, I guess over in Ridgewood, uh, Brooklyn, New York. We talk about mutual aid. Enjoy the show. Recording now. Hello and welcome to the show. Uh, oh shit. That, I turned it off. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to Pod Damn America. This is Q speaking, the new host of the show. Okay, let's get obnoxious really quick. Hi, this is Jake. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pedal that we'll be playing with at some point on this show as soon as I figure out, like, a character other than Q. Uh, it sounds a lot like Anon, like the uh, anonymous Sky Fox mask guy. Well, yeah, Q Anon. That's his last name. Uh, it's the same guy? He's one of them that went rogue. I don't know. I'm just making up lore now. Uh, hi, I'm Jake Flores. This is Pod Damn America. Anders Lee is here. Yeah, Anders Lee here. Uh, from the Antifada, our pal Andy Gitlitz. Andy Gitlitz here. <laughs> and um, we'll be talking today with also uh, from Woodbine Mutual Aid Center Group. What the fuck am I doing with that? Uh, Matt Peterson, welcome to the show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love mutual it. center group yeah um network what are we uh what's the official title here i just call it woodbine yeah just woodbine's good okay all right cool it's a, it's a hub it's not a center <laughs> a hub is a center of a wheel so it's a kind of center <laughs> mm. yeah that makes sense that's there's a bike place i used to go to called the hub yeah. So it's a hub. <laughs> Double entendre. I am jacked into the hub, and I don't know. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop doing that. Uh, all right, so we're talking <laughs> to Woodbine today, and um, we're talking to Andy also, who does stuff with Woodbine because I guess the topic of the day is mutual aid, um, or is it? I don't know. We talked about that a little bit before the show. If that's maybe not a good way to brand this, but. Um, I guess I thought it was kind of an interesting thing to talk about, given that we're at like um, a, like a much different point than we were at the beginning of the pandemic, when everyone was a buzz about mutual aid. Uh, if you remember, scant a year ago, last March and April, when uh, no one knew what the fuck was going to happen and the world was very scary and falling apart. Um, People were really into this idea, so it was something that was kind of taking the forefront in a lot of leftist organizing. Also, I think probably because uh, Bernie had just sort of lost, so everyone went, well, I guess it's uh, anarchism now, you know? Um, AOC was doing memes about it. Everyone was talking about rent strikes and things like that. Uh, we talked about it on this show. I talked about Kropotkin a little bit. You know, people started doing grocery runs and you sort of saw this thing happen where people were organizing like, um, yeah, impromptu networks to sort of fill in the gaps where the state was failing while we, we kind of thought, you know, things were going to permanently sort of crash and burn into the ground. Also, that Twitter lady did the sexual mutual aid tweet and that was pretty fun. That was timely, I think. Um, that was a weird one. So... <laughs> That was, uh, I guess, uh, that was kind of an interesting counterpoint to where we're at now because the pandemic feels a lot different right now. There's a vaccine on the horizon, and I thought it might be interesting to check in on people that are uh, with people that are actively engaged in like doing mutual aid, um, and talk to you guys a little bit about what it feels like right now. Um, whether you know things have panned out in the way that we maybe imagined or I imagined or outsiders imagined way back early last year. Um, you know, what, have people forgotten about all this? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about what Woodbine is maybe to start off. Sure. So 
one of the things I want to say, like in response to that, is you know now we're about a year into you know the pandemic. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of like the Cuomo and De Blasio's state of emergency declarations, and well, some aspects of the the pandemic or the virus have changed, but a lot haven't really. And you know, there's still you know now we're supposed to wear two masks or something, and we're back to washing our hands, and you know, people are still getting tested, you know, weekly, and you know, the vaccine. There's a lot of there's different strains kind of going around or whatever, and the economic situation hasn't really approved at all, if not, you know, gotten worse in a lot of ways. So, you know, mutual aid came about as this sort of response. You know, normally mutual aid, you know, in recent times is used in response to like disasters, like when there's an earthquake or a hurricane or something like that. And it's this like emerging response. And, you know, for better or worse, that's sort of how people use it. You know, now, whether or not that's still applicable a year later, you know, we could talk about or think about that, what that means. But I think the question is, you know, we're in this extended perpetual disaster crisis and, you know, people have to find ways to survive or sort of support each other, support their neighbors. And, you know, we, you know, we can call that mutual aid, you know, call what we're doing mutual aid if we want or if that feels helpful or if that's like a distraction because of the ways in which that's overcoded. And, you know, the other thing, last thing, other thing I'll say real quick is that, you know, there's been this like fatigue, you know, fatigue of COVID, you know, like people sick of social distancing or sick of the virus or whatever. But there's also been this journalistic fatigue of mutual aid. You know, people are sick of covering it or talking about it. But I think in a way what what that reveals is people are really just sick of like poverty. You know, it's, it's no longer cool or attractive or sexy or interesting to talk about the people that kind of fall through the cracks or, you know, out of state or economic, you know, support or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's, it's unpleasant to think about people standing on food lines or, you know, who need support or whatever. And I think, you know, that's one of the questions we can think about after a year is like, what do we do with all these people on the food lines or on unemployment or who, who have no access to state aid or can't find work or something, you know, what, what is their condition or reality or how do we relate to that or something as a community or as a, you know, radical group of people or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, we can call that mutual aid or not. And, you know, just Woodbine is a space that we started at the end of 2013 after Hurricane Sandy and after Occupy Wall Street, a physical space we opened in Ridgewood to kind of organize around. And we really tried to jump, you know, however we could after the state of emergency in March. Uh, if I could just jump in here, I mean, I think it if it would be helpful to maybe, yeah, talk a little bit about Woodbine's history and, you know, what what it has been doing up until the pandemic. And, and since um, I, I've, for the record, I uh, have been going to Woodbine since 2015. I was in, head, uh, the, in charge of uh, sexual mutual aid there for a number of years. <laughs> Uh, I was riding a bike around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I guess I do want to sort of zero in on. Um, w- w- I'm sensing sort of an ambivalence to the term mutual aid. Uh, why not embrace it? Why? I mean, it, I understand the point of, of journalistic fatigue or, or about the that particular term, but isn't that just going to be the case with whatever you know sort of label that that you choose? And, and why not for the sake of you know coherence and um, having a a clear mission, not not claim the mantle of mutual aid. Well, I think that's why we did choose that term initially. So if you go to woodbine.com slash mutual aid, that'll it'll explain our project. And that um, actually came before we started the food pantry there. Uh, so we did use mutual aid just as like the most basic um, or the or the just to, to explain what we wanted to do. Um, and we didn't really talk too much about like the semantics of it. Uh, but a- as time has gone on, there's been so many mutual aid groups in the city, dozens, if not hundreds of them, like multiple ones in every neighborhood, um, that it's just become uh, a way for people to identify who's doing this kind of work and to start linking up and working together. And it doesn't say anything necessarily super specific about like, who the people doing it are or what kind of vision they have for the world or 
how they get their resources or what kind of resources. It's just uh, it's just kind of a signifier that you are in it to um, share and uh, whether this pandemic or you know change the way society works uh, in some way. And I think some people assume that that's just anarchism or um, or some kind of revolutionary project because of the associations with the word. And that's just not the case. So that's kind of frustrating to me because I am interested in radical politics. Uh, it's frustrating to see like democratic politicians talking about mutual aid um, when really what they're saying is we need volunteers to do work for us because we don't have enough resources. Like the state isn't capable of taking care of this problem. So you can do it for us. It's, it's practically an austerity measure from their perspective. Um, so, uh, but that doesn't mean that like the work that people are doing is any more or less valuable because their politics are, you know, more or less like mine, you know, it's the, the important thing is that we do network and we do figure out better ways to share and make these networks stronger and figure out how to survive uh, catastrophes like the pandemic or um, before that, uh, hur the hurricanes, uh, like uh, I think Woodbine was initially conceived out of um, some of the, the fallout from the two hurricanes that hit New York at the beginning of the, of the last decade. So people just naturally do this, you know, no matter what they are really. Uh, and just assuming that what people naturally do is somehow coherent politically is not correct. But it, it's valuable regardless of that coherence. Okay. Well, well so before we I, – I think we're approaching some kind of interesting stuff that I wanted to talk about in talking about how this uh, branding interacts with the way that, like, Democratic politicians are using it and stuff like that. But before we even kind of get into that and before we even talk about maybe even Woodbine, uh, you know what? I want to back all the way up and to do, uh, you know, uh, an explainer, a little primer. My podcast is for idiots. Um so if you're listening and you're just, uh, you know, casually listening on your way to work or something and you're like, what the fuck is mutual aid? Let's start here. Um, I wanted to sort of lay out how this thing is associated with anarchist politics. Um, I, let's let's uh, let's start with Kropotkin. Uh, I don't know where else to start. I read uh, half of. Kropotkin's mutual aid while I was sitting around thinking about all this stuff. Uh, I didn't you just read it. the mutual part. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't finish it, so nobody tell me how it ends. I just got to uh, medieval times, but I have a feeling I know where he's going with this. Um, <laughs> Kropotkin writes this book, uh, or uh, you know, a collection of essays, Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution. And um, it's released in 1902. I think it has a pretty interesting message. It's, you know, maybe controversial, but basically he starts off by talking about Darwin and how um, Darwin, you know, argues at some point and really is this is more emphasized by people that come after Darwin that sort of take advantage of what he's saying. Um, you know, it's, it's really more his, his successors than even him. Uh, but there's this argument that comes out of Darwin's research that um, is very like Hobbesian and it's that you know w we are sort of come from this like savage past and that uh, that the entirety of what do you call it what's the fucking Darwin term um, natural selection is motivated by this dominant factor which is f like fighting and competition within your own group of species so the traditional Darwinist like idea of uh how animals evolve is that a bunch of fucking parrots are together and then there's a scarcity of food and they all fight each other and then the strongest parrot lives and you know progenerates and stuff like that and now you have stronger parrots or whatever and Kropotkin sort of looks at this and goes uh it's weird that that this is what people took away from Darwin because his research isn't really indicative of that. And also, if you look at all this other shit in the first few chapters of mutual aid, it's not really seem doesn't really seem to be the case. So he lays out an argument where he talks all about how fucking ducks and birds and ants and, you know, all sorts of animals actually seem to um survive and uh like multiply when they are sociable and when they uh, you know, form, you know, these little communities and stuff like that. And so he lays out an argument that there's something maybe more natural 
um, and that something that is more the dominant factor in natural selection is uh, mutual aid. Was, like, he uses the term itself, um, which I think uh, I certainly tend to agree with uh, myself, but, you know, people argue about it. And uh, he also sort of eventually connects this to, you know, going from ants fucking, you know, coughing up acidy food on each other to share it with each other and fucking toucans hanging out with each other and, uh, you know, bats communicating and stuff like that all the way into early, like, hunter-gatherer society, then barbarian society, then feudalism, and then, you know, all the way up to where we are now or whatever, or where he was. Um, and... I guess what he's doing in this book is making a counter argument to something like Thomas Hobbes would make, which is that, you know, civilization is the only thing holding people back from their natural impulses, which are to go fucking crazy and fucking kill everything. Um, and I think this is kind of interesting because this is where, like, the argument for police comes from. Oh, you need police because people left to their own devices will fucking go crazy and, you know, rob each other and all this sort of stuff because we're naturally inclined to be destructive. Lord uh, of the flies. Yeah, y yeah exactly. Um, and so <laughs> it's interesting because in like the hunter gatherer part of this book, he's talking about how like even like the, uh, the tendency to not like mate within your own bloodline came about and it came about as a, like a, a thing that benefited the social group, not someone came in and was like, everyone has to stop fucking their sister, you know, <laughs> which is like a crazy way to imagine <laughs> that. Right. But that's the way Hobbes imagined it. And that's the way a lot of, uh, individualistic, like enlightenment thinkers that shaped the way that our entire fucking culture is set up now tend to think about things and tend to explain things, which is very cynical and weird. So, um, <laughs> I guess the, I the idea of Kropotkin, like laying this out as a natural tendency as something that's innate to people is kind of interesting because if I'm reading this book correctly, I think what happens is he sort of says, like, look, you can see it in early man and hunter-gatherer society, and you go through these different phases of society, like a, you know, like a good fucking uh, uh, communist or anarchist will, and you'll you sort of see, you know, we we have all these fucking natural functions where we help each other live in little societies up until property really fucks the whole thing up in feudalism, and then. Uh, you know, then we go into the modern world that we live in that's like terrible and stuff like that. But the idea that it's um, that it's natural is interesting, given that we just experienced this this pandemic tragedy and then all this sort of stuff started happening and you show, start to go, OK, like, is this, um, you know, is, okay, like how this plays into uh, like revolutionary politics and stuff like that, because it's not. It's it's not really like a an end. Well, it's not, it's not really like I don't even know if I want to move into this. This might be getting into the, the next part too fast. Um, I'm just pausing for the sake of organization. Um, I'm sorry. What did you want to say? Uh, well, maybe it would be good to ask if um, what if any sort of uh, link do does Woodbine see between itself and, and Kropotkin? What's their relationship to that? Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good question. All right, let's start there. Yeah, sure. It sounds great. Um, I, you know, I've never read Kropotkin. I don't know if, if Matt has. Uh, you know, I've read a little bit of it, but not mutual aid. <clears throat> but I think there is a lot of, there is a link in, in the sense that a lot of the stuff that um, people who have been involved in Woodbine in the past and, and still today, you know, we, I got like a reading group there, for example, we were really interested in, in groups like the diggers and uh, the motherfuckers from the sixties who had set, set up free stores and free crash pads and basically tried to make it uh, in the context of the sixties and hippies and dropout culture. So everybody didn't have to work and just shared their food and money and resources freely um, and just trying to recreate the city immediately around this vision of, of basically living communism, more or less. Uh, and of course, you also see that kind of tradition in the Black Panthers when they turn to intercommunalism around, 19, around 1970 uh, and the autonomous movement in Italy. Um, and 
you know, you, you see that a lot in like the kind of neo-autonomism of the 90s and the, the 2000s into anti-globe. So that's kind of where we come from, you know, even the, the communization current that gets really popular in around 2008 around the financial crisis. Uh, so this Woodbine has always been about experimenting with immediately trying to create some kind of autonomy, some kind of uh, way that we can live meaningful lives here and now without waiting for the creation of a vanguard party or revolution or something. Um, so I do think that that puts us somewhat in the tradition uh, of, of Kropotkin, uh, Kropotkin's vision, although I think our references are a little bit more recent. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think the basic kind of scheme of the and is trying to come up with is to lay out, you know, what was he's trying to set up as something natural, but some basis for cooperation or why cooperation is, you know, a better uh, ethic than or something, you know, to, to make it very crude. And, you know, of course we would agree, you know, and our kind of dynamic is not, you know, feudalism or the medieval thing, but neoliberal kind of metropolitan society where, and that, you know, and our condition is different, you know, maybe this can get into some of those class struggle critiques of mutual aid or something, but, you know, our condition is finding ourselves in cities, you know, often separated from our families without the workplace as a basis of organization. You know, we're not organizing on the basis of, you know, ethnicity or religion or anything like that. So, you know, when we're trying to think about what cooperation looks like, you know, it's for us, it was kind of on the basis of a neighborhood or, you know, around our space, you know, by our organizational form being a space, a physical space rather than, you know, a party or a group or something like that. And then the framework being a neighborhood, you know, that gave us a kind of basis to think about where and how the experimentation would, would take place. And then the form of cooperation or self-organization we're thinking about is on that scale of the neighborhood. And, you know, again, mutual aid can be a term to describe that horizon or framework is that we want, you know, basically we want mutual survival, you know, to think about how can people come together to help each other survive. And, you know, that can be literal in the case of like food, you know, food distribution as a very basic elemental human survival. But the other kind of dynamic, especially in COVID, but even before was this kind of fragmented, fractious reality where people are just totally diffuse and alone and isolated in the city, you know, where they might not have friends, they don't have family, you know, the, depending on people's forms of immigration or, you know, how they got to the city or how they got to the neighborhood they find themselves in could be totally cut off from any kind of human, you know, collective social contact or something. And that would necessarily have to be the precondition for any you know, resistance, you know, form of organized resistance or something. So that's basically the cooperation, you know, we've been interested in or, or working towards. Um, and, you know, that's just heightened now in COVID. And, you know, the, the, the other dynamic or paradigm we're fighting, you know, in COVID versus our mutual aid work is the dominance of things like Amazon or Seamless or Netflix or Zoom or whatever to kind of individualize people's social lives at home or, you know, or even Twitter or podcasts where everyone's just individualized at home alone versus, you know, an IRL mutual aid thing is that you have to kind of go outside and be with someone else and kind of hand them food directly, you know, all these kind of physical, tactile, sensual aspects of being alive. You know, that's part of the contestation today, I think, you know, in the mutual aid work is, the IRL presence versus, you know, the Silicon Valleyization, you know, of existence today or something. So, so that's part of the, you know, fronts, you know, we're kind of fighting or whatever. Okay. I think that's kind of interesting because um, I guess as I was reading like Kropotkin and, and he's talking about how this thing sort of naturally blooms out of humans, you know, necessity to live alongside each other in little villages and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, engage in, uh, you know, primitive accumulation and like, you know, tend the crops together and stuff like that. Um, he's sort of describing this thing as like as this natural tendency that uh, didn't 
that doesn't come in reaction to a disaster. It's just the way things kind of would naturally be if we were all just sort of hanging out together without things being really, really fractured and atomized through all this neoliberal bullshit that, you know, lays over our lives in the society right now. But um, like you were saying, like, you know, there's sort of this spike at the beginning of the the pandemic. Not that that's when you guys started, but that there was just a spike in the the popularity of the concept of mutual aid. Um, and then people sort of got this fatigue eventually because I think it was being perceived of as a short term project, like a, a response to a disaster, and not uh, like a long term thing. Which is, uh, in theory, like I, this should be sort of bec- something that becomes so um, frequent in people's lives and so, like, ever-present that, uh, I guess to me in my head, the, the main goal is, like, to get back to the, the, the hunter-gatherer sort of, you know, naturally occurring thing where we just sort of take care of each other. Um, but that raises an interesting question. Like, can that happen while we're living under all of this other shit? Um, or, and is it also bad if we you know if if we set up these ways of sustaining each other which only seem to really uh you know like benefit the people that we're in like class conflict with because i think as somebody put it in one of these articles that i'll link to um we're just doing the regen like the reproductive labor (laughs) that they normally would have to do but like for them so that we eventually, you know, go back to work anyway and then we fed each other for fucking free. Um, yeah, that's that. see, that's why I sent you that article because I think that's a good critique. Um, that's the uh, the article in Regeneration called uh, Mutual Aid, a Factor uh, in Liberalism or something like that. Yeah. Um, a Factor of Liberalism. Uh, but I think at Woodbine we are trying to do something different, which is we're not just... We, did, we didn't just come together and say, wow, the pandemic's a real crisis. We got to like figure out how to help people for the duration of it. Like, I don't think anyone said that. Uh, we said, wow, but something huge is happening. We have this space, we have people, uh, and we don't just want to be shut inside uh, social distancing this entire time. Um, but we don't want to be dicks and just like pretend like nothing's happening and, you know, and keep like having reading groups and co-working or whatever. And having, and having dinners, like that's what we normally did at Woodbine. So we shut down the space and we turned it into a mutual aid space and a food pantry, not only because we thought it was like a nice thing to do or like we thought mutual aid is such a good idea, but because we wanted to continue doing this, the, the work of the space, which is experimenting as a neighborhood hub of, uh, of building autonomy, of living differently uh, in the here and now, and um, we just had the opportunity to like get a lot of food from this group that we're, we work with it's called Hungry Monk. Um, they, they were doing food distributions two or three days a week. And they said, we can do it even more days a week. Um, so we just took that food for the extra two days and started packaging it up and handing it out in the morning. And like the first morning we did it, I think like, uh, you know, 10 to 15 people came. Um, and then the next time it was like 50 and the next time it was a hundred. And, and now we regularly, there was regularly two to 300 people or more in line. And we've just kept like receiving and packaging up and handing out the food as a way, not only because it's like a nice thing to do and it's like cool to meet our neighbors and stuff, but because it, it gives some meaning to our lives. Whereas we could just be sitting online you know, watching TV, telecommuting, uh, or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, also on top of that, like I quit my job when the pandemic pandemic started and, uh, as, as good as podcasting is for me as a business, um, I, I needed that extra job, but with the, with the food pantry, I get enough food for myself that I don't have to do that extra job. So nice. that, that's something oh, like a stress is that we, we don't just do this because of our poor neighbors or something. We do it because we also want to learn how to get and share resources. Oh, you might say that it is mutual, the benefit. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> is, a, is an important part of it. Oh. Right. And I mean, just speaking for myself, I think this is why to me, I, I think it is worth um, sort of sticking by mutual aid uh, as a term. And, and, you know, there are maybe not in all 
connotations and uses. But uh, for me, this is my view of, of communism. It, that really should be the organizing principle of, of society, you know, to each their own ability, to each their own need. And I dream one day of a world where that replaces uh, capital and currency, et cetera. Um, and I think one of the values in doing it is sort of the, the prefigurative value, if you will. Like, uh, it, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I found out about this through Woodbine. I can't remember exactly, but uh, I stayed on Lazad uh, a couple years ago, which is a commune and or a network of communes in, in France that uh, operates mostly under a, a sort of a mutual aid system. Uh, so that can be really useful in, in getting people to sort of understand what a, a different society would look like. Um, but I guess one of the critiques, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to see if this applies to Woodbine, whether you consider what you do mutual aid or not, is that um, sometimes if, if you are doing a prefigurative thing, uh, it can be sort of uh, cloaks the enemies, right? That there's there's not always a, a clearly defined enemy in mutual aid. And I mean, I think one of the signs that um, DSA, and to be clear, I'm, I was, you know, I've never been like a heavily involved Woodbine. I've done dishes at Woodbine, but I, I guess mm-hmm. my political home is more DSA. Uh, I think one of the, the signs that we're really onto something is that pe- we people in the New York City sort of political patronage class have started to denounce us and say we are, you know, <laughs> all kinds of nasty, terrible things. Um, is that happening with Woodbine? Are you making enemies in, in Ridgewood, in the neighborhood from, from you know, bosses and cops, et cetera? I mean, I think one of the dynamics is like, like we were saying, you know, in anyone's imagination of communism, you know, there would have to be an essential core tenant of mutual aid which makes the kind of pushback or resistance or hostility to it interesting. And, you know, that makes that term interesting to contest. And I think, you know, one of the limitations or contradictions, as we've been saying, is typically how it's been used the last, I don't know, five to ten years is in association with a disaster where there's like a moment of mutual aid, where it's like temporally limited. So it's like if we're responding to a hurricane or an earthquake or a flood or whatever, then like we have this outpouring of volunteer labor and you know we're calling that mutual aid for or whatever but then you know it's supposed to end you know normally those kind of disasters you know there's a few days of immediate work and then a few weeks or whatever and then as time goes by you know there's some kind of return to normal you know now with something like covid you know the disaster of this you know global pandemic as it doesn't end you know, we're confronted with a new paradigm of what exactly we're organizing around and towards and with or whatever. And that's an interesting, you know, question or dynamic. I mean, one of the things is at first with COVID, there is a sense that this virus could affect anyone at any time and potentially be fatal. And that kind of flattened the experience of it where everyone is kind of nervous or whatever, you know, that like, am I going to die? You know, am I going to be in one of those ambulances I hear outside my house? You know, as the weeks or months went on, you know, younger, able-bodied people didn't feel like that. And then people who had an income or had some, you know, accumulated wealth or whatever also didn't worry about themselves economically. And that really created this division of people who felt like they were implicated in COVID and people who didn't. And, you know, in some ways, then our work shifted from like so-called disaster relief to basically something like poverty relief, for lack of a better word. You know, we wouldn't call it that. And basically realizing that people aren't that interested in poverty relief. You know, it's not attractive. It's not sexy. It's boring. It's kind of wretched or whatever. It's grotesque. People don't like to look at it. And that's where the fatigue comes in. And that's where this question about whether or not mutual aid as a momentary kind of immediate disaster response is an applicable framework to, to think of it as. And for us as Woodbine, you know, since we've been in a space or a group for seven years, thinking about these questions of building autonomy or living communism or kind of an ethical framework to politics, for lack of a better word, it was frustrating for us to be kind of blanketed as just a mutual aid thing because it sort of limits the the framework of how we've been trying to operate, you know, now for seven years or, you know, Andy and I have known each other for about a dozen years or something in, in similar kind of political milieus. So it's like, that's one of the frustrations around the term 
but yeah, there is this strange kind of contradiction where any, you know, socialist or communist, you know, imaginary of their utopian society would include mutual aid. You know, that would be the framework of how things would be organized or whatever. Um, so it's weird that there's this resistance to it. You know, the last thing I'll say about the enemies is, and, and this gets to a little bit, you know, that, that regeneration article is, you know, one of the critiques is whether or not how mutual aid relates to like class struggle, so to speak, you know, um, and it's kind of viewed in this narrow frame as like, you know, bosses or landlords, or we need to have some kind of offensive organization to bosses or landlords. But in reality, I think most of the political contradictions, the, the horizon is some mediation by the state. So we're, we're not really organizing or seeing ourselves like as workers or as proletarians. It's, you know, we would never use this term, but it's in reality, it's something more like citizens or like inhabitants of a city or something where it's like, if you think about rent, you think about wages, if you think about health care, you know, food, you know, school, everything is like we're asking the state for something. So it's like we're not asking the bosses or landlords, even the rent kind of strike or whatever. It, it wasn't really seen as like a contestation between individuals and their landlords. People wanted the state to intervene or something. So the the enemy in terms of organizing is basically logistic. Is if when you think about how kind of resources and wealth and value and food or whatever are distributed in New York City or the U.S., it's a kind of logistical nightmare. And you know our work is basically to enter that supply chain chain to kind of extract whatever we can from it for free to kind of disrupt that economy. But it's like in terms of viewing it as class struggle or something. I mean. You know, we might disagree here, but I just don't really see that as the framework. You know, what every every kind of DSA demand is to the state. You know, you want fifteen dollar minimum wage. We want Medicare for all. We want a Green New Deal. You know, everything is asking the state for things. So it's not really organizing as workers in a class struggle context. It's basically, for better or worse, organizing as citizens, asking the state for kind of wealth distribution or whatever regulation. So mutual aid in our context is just neighborhood organization, but not sort of as workers, not as class struggle. And I don't think that's our fault. I just don't think that's the paradigm of reality right now that we're living in. That's well, I, think I, I, I just want to jump in and say that sure. Matt and I do have some disagreements over, over this question of class struggle. And, uh, but I think what's made our food pantry work is that we kind of set that aside just to do the work of um, – of the experiment of like sharing and sharing at a larger and larger scale, which is one way to interpret what communism is. Like another way, of course, is to say it's the working class seizing the means of production and installing a dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, but that's not, you know, we, we could like, I could maybe find 15 people that like really agree with me on that definition and have that program. And we would be totally isolated because what people are more interested in is this mutual aid, is getting resources for free for free because they need to, is meeting people, um, you know, expanding their network in a time when everybody's shut in and isolated. And I think other mutual aid groups who have like really tried to front load their politics uh, have, have unfortunately kind of fallen apart uh, to, in, in different degrees because those political questions are a little bit too abstract um, in terms of what the actual task at hand is. Uh, so even though Matt and I might disagree on something like this, um, it's and, and even though like a lot of people that come to the food pantry are coming from different backgrounds, you know, uh, and who like a lot of them probably really wouldn't agree or like our politics if like we really hashed them out. Uh, that kind of it doesn't matter in the moment because we're just sort of making like uh, friendships and meeting our neighbors and you know, uh, before when we were a little bit more politically isolated or like culturally isolated, when we were having these dinners, people probably just thought that we were hipsters or artists or something. But now you can go to Woodbine on a day when we're packing and most of the people there are, are speaking Spanish uh, and or people there have kids or, you know, it's it's like a totally different scene because we're doing something really different. And I think part of that is is we've set these kind of ideological questions aside and kind of tested them at the same time through this project. Do you I, have tortilla soup today? <laughs> All right. That was an anonymous guy going to Woodbine. Um, yeah. I mean, ahead. if I could, I, not to beat a dead horse here, or I guess to do that, fine. Uh, but I feel like, you know, in the just this past week, we've seen, 
Robin Hood has posted their sort of definition of of socialism and they compare it to you say the Nazis were a socialist regime, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. I... <laughs> <laughs> rightly or wrongly, like they took it down. there's really no one singular definition of socialism. I just think that's true of all political terms, right? So uh, if you have something like mutual aid that's being used, it, it's, it's seen as temporal and just not really what what we would um, think it, think of it as. I, I guess I don't see the uh, the way to change that as running away from it. it, rather to, you know, embrace it and try to reclaim it and get, you know, while people are talking about it, show well, this is what we mean by it. Um, and as for like DSA, I think, you know, the demand is redistribution, right? And there is, um, a lot of the demands are placed on workplaces and, and unionization. And, uh, cause you know, I, and this may be an area where we disagree too, I guess, Andy and I fall on the same side. I think that's, you know, I'm traditional Marxist. I think change happens through class struggle and the workplace ultimately is, I think, more important than, um, than state demands. But, uh, how, you know, the issue to me seems like not that we can't uh, share resources or we shouldn't share the resources we do have, but the problem is we don't have enough of them, right? We need to redistribute. Uh, so h- how does how, – I, I just don't see a way around that issue. So I, I guess how does Woodbine or, or your goals or networks that you're in um, sort of meet that uh, challenge? I mean, I think the question – is you know is is infrastructural or logistical or institutional which means having to navigate these state agencies and these charity programs and these kind of church organizations and where us as like an autonomous group to not necessarily have like a moralistic critique or a hostility or antagonism to them but if our goal is to kind of extract or re- redirect or divert as much resources as we can. We have to figure out how to navigate them. But in the process, there's also a kind of interesting learning curve about seeing how power actually functions, you know, and in a city like New York, you know, the largest city in the U.S., you know, there's and in Hunt's Point where there was just this uh, strike recently, I think is, you know, one of the largest food depots in the world, you know, for better or worse, our food, you know, depot distribution system is centralized in this kind of hub, as we were saying earlier, in the Bronx. Um, But, you know, these both of these things are, you know, pedagogical in a sense about how how just stuff circulates, you know, Mm -hmm. in the city, you know, how money circulates, how food circulates, how how labor circulates, how people have access to to resources like unemployment or a vaccine. You know, all of these things are, are basically questions of circulation and supply and logistics or something. And, you know, what we were able to do as a group of people self-organizing together is try to figure out together how can we understand or interpret or kind of intervene in these supply lines to kind of provide for people. But, you know, in the process, we're showing that, you know, the state or the media or kind of the workplace isn't able or interested to kind of to do that. You know, they just really just don't know. There's so many people that they can't reach. They don't know how to reach even a lot of the food that we were getting from the city or kind of federal programs. They just literally didn't know how to distribute it. So we would get calls from like politicians, you know, calling Woodbine and be like, can you help us distribute, you know, these tons of food that like they have that's literally going to go bad. You know, it's, you know, food is like a temporally, you know, time sensitive, perishable object. You know, it's not like a permanent thing. So, you know, sometimes we'll have one, two, three days of a window to kind of find, you know, truckloads of food and bring it to Ridgewood and redistribute it. And, you know, all that's just, you know, incredibly fascinating, you know, from a, to understand the logistics of capital, but also just to see like, how is it that people in a major city survive when there's such dysfunctionality, you know, and this is something we saw nationally, you know, New York City has had these food lines, but, you know, nationally you see these car food lines of like miles long, you know, that you see in the news that are just like incredible. Like growing up, you know, this was something I thought of as, you know, the Soviet Union's dysfunctionality, that there was like bread lines and soup lines, you know, I never imagined in the United States or New York City you know, one of the wealthiest places in the world that we would have food lines. You know, this was something that like during the Cold War was unimaginable to kind of present to an American consciousness that that's like the future. 
and to see now like almost a year in that it hasn't decreased at all I think is incredibly you know educational to people about how you know the government and the economy works or something um as long as we're talking about class struggle this this has got me thinking about something that's kind of adjacent to this which is that this summer there was you know this black lives matter uprising um this spate of uh you know reactions to the police that came out sort of uh spontaneously and it was very exciting and it was uh, i i was uh very hopeful about it you know even though obviously we're living in the wake of uh you know ultimately a lot of nothing that came out of it but i remember after the initial sort of euphoria wore off you'd see a lot of like really, really, really orthodox, like Marxist Leninists and stuff like that start to chime in and go, okay, you know, time to fucking shit on the party. Um, this is not a class struggle situation. You know, um, the reason this isn't going to work is because it's, you know, the, the people there, as one person put it, uh, a completely insane Twitter account, uh, where I, I, I don't know if you guys have ever run into this guy's Marxist soccer guy. I was talking to this guy. Oh, yeah. Who, uh, he, he's, the guy with the, the huge the legs. Yeah, yeah. He like, shows his huge legs and he talks about how they're like the most proletarian muscle. So he just works out his legs all day. I mean, lunatic online was talking to me about it. Biceps are bourgeois. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was like, um, he was like, well, they may be workers, but they're not there as workers. And I thought about that and I was like, ah, you know what? The fucking weird leg guy on the internet's got kind of a good point. But, um, I was thinking about it, and I was like, there is kind of this problem with uh, the the Black Lives Matter movement where um, you get really, like, kind of nervous when something is that accessible to liberals because they tend to hijack it. And they also tend to do this thing where they show up, uh, participate in it, capitalize off of it, and then leave without actually engaging in any of the necessary component like class struggle sort of stuff that needs to go along with this sort of stuff um and i think that sort of makes people sort of um want to throw the entire thing out altogether but um i guess it raises these questions about whether um whether any sort of you know praxis or whatever the fuck you want to call it that word is so difficult to say these days <laughs> but uh anything is um you know really like worthwhile or relevant in the absence of it being directly related to class struggle and um i guess this always makes me think about actually this piece that andy wrote called the anti anti antifa about um you know the discourse around anti-fascist organizing where a lot of people say well it's not you know revolutionary and you go well sure but it was no one said it was it just serves its own fucking purpose you know um and i guess to me with the with all of the shortcomings of mutual aid the criticisms where you might look at it and you might go yeah maybe we're doing some fucking labor that might be beneficial to the bosses that's kind of annoying um maybe it isn't ultimately in service of a full-on communist revolution in this country uh yeah that kind of sucks you do also kind of hit this point eventually where you go well that revolution isn't going to happen in my fucking lifetime but like feeding my next door neighbor is and this is a way of actually engaging in um communism like in in the moment now right um so i don't know i guess i'm like looking at this and i'm like are these two ends on a fucking spectrum i mean yeah is, is it not worthwhile to to just sort of engage in this right now without really becoming bogged down with all the uh the implications of it you know, I maybe I'm even being super paranoid here where I'm like, why are we arguing about this? Like, is this fucking op shit or something, you know? Well, it's really it's really easy for a Marxist Leninist or whoever to say the the George Floyd uprising was insufficient or your mutual aid project is insufficient. And what you really should be doing is um, you know, organizing workers to join my party or whatever, or like the party that will exist one day. And it's like, yeah, okay fine, these things are insufficient, obviously. We're not, like, clearly on the road to communism, and the party, you know, we're, we're not all joining the party because the party doesn't exist. That's, like, a lazy critique. Like, it's way more interesting to look at the uprising and say, wow, uh, 
thousands and thousands of people who are working class, um, you might even call them proletarians, from, from marginal neighborhoods uh, who have been like hard hit by the pandemic in different ways, you know, have lost their jobs or the parents have lost their jobs um, and are really pissed off about the way white supremacist society is treating them, uh, looted a bunch of stores and in many cases shared everything freely amongst each other and like cooperated to make sure they could loot the stores without being arrested. Um, so yeah, that's not exactly forming the party and the way those people were changed by organizing that, um, we don't really see, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say that like, well, they were just doing this to grab some stuff. It was just like a, a free for all. Um, but we don't really see the way they might interact with each other or the way, uh, you know, people who participate in these riots have interacted differently after that. Um, and it's also easy to say like, well, they were saying defund or you no, know, they're saying like abolish the police. And then look, the Democrats aren't gonna abolish the police. Well, like they weren't, in my interpretation, they weren't saying abolish the police uh, because they wanted Chuck Schumer to abolish the police. They were, they were doing it because they wanted to get rid of the police in their area immediately or make it, make their area impossible to police in the way that the police currently do it. So again, it's, it's trying to do something immediately in the moment, like trying to come together in society that's telling you to stay at home, be atomized, um, just watch Netflix, just order food and, uh, and, and fight against that in like a direct way, in an immediate way. Um, and the fact that it doesn't last uh, is kind of an illusion because I think the next time there's an uprising like this, it's gonna start at the height of the last one. And that's been what's going on since Occupy uh, or even before that, you know, this this uprising started with burning down a police station, which was like, <laughs> you know, unthinkable even the yeah. day before it. You know, you would be, there are still people online who say that if you try to do that, you'll be shot immediately. Um, so uh, the way that I connect that with our mutual aid effort um, is even though, yeah, like mutual aid is sufficient, you know, just giving food to our neighbors is not going to turn them into communist revolutionaries or, or turn Ridgewood into the commune or something like that. Uh, but that's not exactly why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want to we want to figure out what we can do now. And you learn a lot about how the how the food distribution system works, like how, where this food comes from, um, you know, who the players in that are. Uh, you know, we had to learn like uh, about how trash works in the neighborhood because we had all these piles of of, of boxes. And, and so now and, and so now we just have like a ton of contacts and a ton of knowledge that we didn't have before. And we made, and like, there's a lot of people involved in the space now who are doing like Skillshare workshops. And, you know, uh, uh, um, we've got like a wood shop in the basement now, and we have a gym now. And all this stuff came from us experimenting with sharing. Uh, and so we've grown a lot in terms of our power and our capacity just, just from that simple principle. And then I, I like to think that the politics and like the new forms of living amongst each other will follow from us having more power and more capability and more contacts. Do you feel like it's also sort of a, um, mentioned the term survival earlier, and there's also connotations to, to survivalist, right? People sit and think of, uh, you know, sort of right wingers, but, um, do you feel like what you're doing is sort of preparing for a world uh, after capitalism and not necessarily one in which we've grown out, uh, you know, after past capitalism, but one in which capitalism has, has failed and failed very badly um, and sort of setting up and preparing for that. I mean, I think the dynamic is like for a number of years, you know, I don't know if it's 10 or 30 or 50, you know, the U S has been in just in this decline and we're living in this condition of deterioration but this is while, you know, the population of New York City or the U.S. is increasing. So we have to figure out how to just kind of live or exist or survive amidst this decline. And, you know, it's increasingly clear that the state and, you know, the economy are not capable or interested in, in doing that. And, you know, there's increasing amounts of, you know, so-called surplus population that, you know, aren't able to, to figure out those questions, you know. And I think, you know, what we were talking about earlier, I mean, I think even in the Marxist tradition or communization or whatever, 
there's people who think, you know, that the working class don't participate in movements or struggles as workers. I mean, I think this is part of, you know, discourse in Endnotes or even, you know, in the, in the Joshua Clover book around riot, strike, riot, you know, how the riot returns as this kind of form of a protest outside of the workplace, you know, of workers or something. And I think in the neighborhood, that's another kind of space where it's not necessarily as workers that people kind of meet and exist and, and, and share space together or something. You know, a lot of the people that we interact with at the pantry are, I mean, during COVID, the dominant condition is unemployment, right? So it's like you're dealing with the fact that you're outside of the workplace or, you know, have, don't have access to work. But then there's also, you know, mothers and grandmothers, you know, immigrants and undocumented people, you know, elderly, disabled, senior citizens, you know, all of these people that are traditionally outside of that framework or paradigm. And, you know, they're, the other dynamic of COVID is that they've become visible now, you know, in the absence of, you know, all the wealthy people who many of whom left New York City but also the kind of luxury playground that New York City had become of sort of bars and entertainment centers and restaurants. And, you know, you ride the L train, and you just see assholes on it. You know, all of that has shifted, you know, in the last year for the better, where the, the city is visibly much more working class. You know, you walk around the neighborhoods or the Manhattan or the subways and you just don't see these rich assholes treating the city like a play- playground anymore. And you see a different aspect of New York. And I think doing something like the food pantry or mutual aid brings to light this question of reproduction, you know, social reproduction as a kind of feminist sort of horizon or intervention, which is a question of survival. You know, mm-hmm. how do people survive? How are we going to survive in this ongoing decline, you know, economically, politically, and, you know, environmentally or something? And, you know, that's. And again, the question of survivalism and, and mutuality is basically the, the hypothesis is that we do it together. You know, we don't like stockpile things in our basement or whatever, or learn skills individually, but like we share skills or try to create a, a common space where people can access those things and then, you know, figure out these citywide supply chains that more and more people can kind of figure out how to intervene in. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of the dynamic of survival that we've been thinking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, Something I always think about when I think about mutual aid is that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people in, you know, me and Anders' line of work, uh, comedians would sort of like... <laughs> throw together these like we have to save comedians like this like thing that i think i don't think they used the language of mutual aid or knew what any of this shit was but they were just like i have to sh- fucking you know create a lifeline for people like me and it struck me as really stupid and short-sighted and i think something that's kind of interesting that happened is that a lot of those people you know lived through that week and then went oh wait shit this is not going away and then got got involved in actual mutual aid where you uh you know, you aren't like specifically um, imagining of your fellow man as the other people in your like weird media class or your, you know, social media network or something like, no, it's the people in your building and stuff like that. And uh, so for that reason, this has been, I think, a, a boon to uh, some people, at least in terms of actually learning how to connect to the people around you and how to uh, form a society that isn't, uh, I don't know, isn't that weird and sad and fractured? It's like, uh, no, this is is really good. This is a really good feeling to, you know, actually be part of this neighborhood and not be somebody who's like, yeah, like you said, like using like a playground or whatever. Um, I think also this is kind of just connected back to what I was talking about earlier, but um, this is a great, like gateway into learning about all this other shit that we're talking about, you know? Um, I guess that argument can kind of go both ways. You could say, Oh no, it's, it's too open. It means anyone can come in here and the cops can come in here and then fucking, you know, take over the movement or whatever. But it's, uh, but it's also, um, directly, I guess, kind of solves the problem of, uh, you know, how, how do we get people organizing, for uh against their bosses and stuff like that later on when that becomes more like relevant and like the long term i guess um yeah i can definitely see how yeah because t- 
to me, really, you know, I mentioned the workplace, but I think housing is another front that is hugely important to organize people um, to go on rent strike and then to also just disrupt evictions, especially illegal ones. Uh, and I could absolutely see how sort of a neighborhood organization uh, serves that purpose and gets people to, you know, form solidarity based on the, the place they live and, and the people they live around and, and hopefully get people to see, you know, a path for uh, social housing and, and actually controlling your building and uh, place of living democratically. You know, yeah, without there's the, the Ridgewood Tenant Union that has a is like connected with, you know, hundreds or, or thousands of tenants in our neighborhood. And they're organizing really hard to, uh, you know, to block evictions and uh, you know help people fight their landlords um, that if they're being if they're being squeezed out, um, and that's you know really good work. It's 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 like a little different than what we do, but like if if there was going to be an eviction defense in our neighborhood, I think that like the people who pack food at the food pantry would go there and support it because um, uh, that's kind of just. You don't have to have like really, you know, uh, workerous politics to know that throwing someone out of their house is wrong. Yeah. Uh, uh, so like, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I just think that, you know, what we do is kind of particular and like the, the vision that Matt and I are talking about is kind of particular. It's, it's you know, even for us, like we're kind of just, I think, speaking for ourselves, you know, you could talk to a third Woodbine person that would explain it a little bit differently. Um, but the important thing is that we do have like this project together, um, and it does have momentum and it, and it does have, uh, uh, and it is dynamic in its way. Um, so the fact that we, you know, have relationships with people from the Ridgewood, uh, tenant union, and we have relationships with this other mutual aid project that's right down the street, which is like an interesting story. It's a, a taxi service that, uh, just, oh, lo- I, they, the- I've used them. Yeah, Phoenix Drunkenly, Taxi Service. Yes. They they just <laughs> love the idea of the of the food distributions and especially the free fit fridges and they just put two free fridges out front of their place and keep them stocked so people can just go to the fridge anytime they want and they do a distribution. Um, so, you know, we're all we're all like coming from different places and have different ideas. Um, but uh, you know, I I think it's organically it, uh, moving in a direction that, like, if if someone tries to fuck with a tenant or you know fuck with a worker in the neighborhood, we're going to have each other's backs because that's the kind of you know uh, that's the kind of solidarity that's being produced. Right. Yeah, we're the we're, we're bringing back the young lords. <laughs> uh, Hopefully. Well, I guess probably should round out here pretty soon. Uh, the last thing I was kind of wondering was um, someone, anyone listening to my to this might be wondering how do you start doing this sort of thing if you have this inclination inside of you and if this all sounds cool how, how did that how did that happen for you how um how can someone else do this like effectively i guess uh shit i mean you know like you know annie and i have known each other like i said for about a dozen years you know people hopefully meet each other in various you know social cultural political contexts and form some a basis of a something and then put something in common, you know, and can get a space or start a website or start a Facebook group or Twitter or whatever. And, you know, for us, it was easy because we had a physical space. So everything could be organized around that. And that became the hub to kind of gather food and then have times and days where people could come and bring stuff and pick stuff up. You know, that was easy. But if you don't have a space, I mean, You could talk to, you know, a church or community space or any kind of vacant commercial storefront. You know, one of the things we were able to do was there was this vacant Taekwondo studio in the neighborhood. And we talked to some community partners and we got uh, six months free rent out of it, you know, for our partner, Hungry Monk. And, you know, as far as housing, you know, Hungry Monk, our main partner in the food pantry is a, a homeless outreach organization. And they were doing this, you know, years before COVID. So, you know, I think these networks people are forming, you know, it just in terms of neighborhood engagement, you know, before a crisis or disaster happens. And then the question is, how do you mobilize those networks that you have, you know, in the moment? And, you know, I think that's what we've been able to do. But you have to just figure out how to start somewhere. I think, you know, Facebook or social media, you know, all these Facebook groups or mutual aid groups 
a lot of them were just strangers who didn't know each other at all and started to get together and find a space or make, you know, Google Docs and spreadsheets and things like that. You know, now a year in, I'm sure people in most places have experimented. So there's already something to plug into if you just poke around. But, you know, for us, I, I would just say again, like, you know, we're interested, you know, we're not against mutual aid. The question is, how do we extend it beyond what people thought initially was this short term disaster into a kind of long term, years long, you know, decades long political project? And that's really the the political question we're thinking about. And just a quick thing on top of that is, uh, I think Woodbine came out of Occupy. And I think, you know, after Occupy Wall Street, there was several spaces that opened up, and Woodbine was one of them. So, um, I, like like I was saying before, although it's very easy to critique, critique Occupy for uh, a lot of reasons for not being sufficient in certain ways, people meet each other there, and like form new groups and realize that they have some ideas and like try to figure out how to put stuff in common. So like if, if you're listening to this and you feel really isolated and you don't know what to do, um, I, like one thing is always to plug into the thing that you might not think is sufficient or the best tactic because something new will come out of that. Uh, and um, I think, you know, like Woodbine now is way different than it was when it started, like a, a different largely different group of people with like some kind of different ideas. So these things kind of evolve over time. Um, and like, uh, but what's, what stayed the same about it is it's been a place where if you are kind of isolated in Ridgewood, you can come here to a dinner or now to pack or give out food. And so it is something that you can just plug into and meet people. And, you know, if you keep coming, eventually you could be part of Woodbine, you know? You know what I, I'm kind of thinking about is, uh, like, okay, so we're recording this podcast on Zoom right now, right? Um, a year ago, I didn't know what Zoom really was. I think we maybe used a different program to do this every once in a while. But uh, mostly we fucking took trains across the city to get into the same room with each other to record a <laughs> podcast for no fucking reason. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, why we should keep this after the pandemic is over. Um now, the, you know, this whole experience has introduced like a new way of thinking about this and a new fixture into our lives. Um, that is something I think that's going to continue after the pandemic. And I think that's like a, a kind of an interesting way of looking at uh, I guess what I'm trying to do here is draw a parallel between this and like if you set up something because there was an emergency during all of this, maybe keep that shit around and, and nurture it into something that is more like permanent that isn't necessarily just disaster relief or something like that what, well what i'm really hoping and sort of tangential but what i'm really hoping is that we remain you know people who are now working from home uh are able to keep doing that and that will give i mean obviously that can't work for everybody but uh that will give more people more time to be in their <clears throat> communities and not at work because that's a big really toxic thing about capitalism too, is you have, you know, companies like Google where it's like, there's no reason to leave, just stay here all day, you know? Yeah. Uh, whereas now people have, hopefully will have the opportunity to, to spend more time, you know, around their, their neighbors and other people they know. Yeah. Everyone's hella organized because of all this. I know they made fun of this in that article. Like, yeah, it's, it's sometimes libs get really excited about mutual aid. Cause they're like, I'm so good at emails, you know, but it's like, you know, that's, <laughs> that's fucking part of it, you know? And, um, I guess the final thing I kind of wanted to say about this is that this just occurred to me while I was thinking about all this, but, um, you know, if you, uh, if you listen to this show and you're like, thinking how do i organize a bunch of people to do something like this in my town uh you're probably some fucking weird ass comedian in lubbock texas or something the dope and mike you idiot go get together with all those people you fucking hang out with for no reason and pretend like you know your art is important and do this instead or also or something <laughs> Uh, Create an international network of creative bars that are cooperative <laughs> and free I mean, weird shit like stand up and the arts and you know fucking bars and stuff like that do serve as ways that connect people that would be otherwise be completely 
separate and you know atomized from each other in society so anything could be a starting point for just Absolutely. organizing some shit like this you know yeah yeah a number of the woodbine people met like skateboarding you know what i mean like that it was inconceivable that skateboarders would you know run a food pantry or something but it's like you know you don't know how and when those relationships or encounters will turn into something. Skateboarders running the community center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a, another thing that uh, I should have mentioned earlier is that a lot of the people who are at Woodbine now, like all the time, like working at the food pantry and on other projects, were people who were in the line initially, uh, who, who just like needed to get food, mm. and they just they just found like uh, a place that they could come to and hang out and spend time and do something productive. And a lot of people just like to, to give and to share. And it's not just a political thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone's situation is different. Like if you really are super isolated uh, and you want to like uh, turn, turn your closed comedy club into a experimental community hub that uh, is, is seeking to create communism and love it, Texas, um, you know, there's only one way to find out that it's impossible, and that's to try to do it. <laughs> oh, the well. Experiment Communism Gallery. Oh, there Three you go. people get that. <laughs> no. Michelle Commune. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you get that joke, then you probably get why I'm saying no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, yeah. Yeah, there was a, a bad thing happened at that place. A guy did a bad thing. <sighs> Is that town named after John Lovett? Huh? Is it named after John Lovett's? <laughs> The experiment. A love book. Oh, love it. Oh, love it. Okay. <laughs> John Lubbock, though. That would be a cool guy. They should rename it Love It Texas. Yeah. Yeah. It stinks. It's like the on the billboard when you drive it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I think that's probably pretty good. Thanks for joining us. And uh, where can we got to plug the uh, fundraiser? Of course. Plug away. Yeah, we're, Woodbine just moved in November to a space that's like three times as large, but also it's more expensive in rent. So we launched a GoFundMe and, you know, our website's woodbine.nyc and we have, you know, social media, but we can link to that GoFundMe, I guess, and whatever, you know, copy there is attached to this. Cool. Yeah, just cool. send me that info. I'll put it in the show notes and any of my, uh, especially our New York listeners, obviously. We have a lot of listeners yeah. in, here in town. And come check that out. Uh, anybody else? Plugs. Normal shit. Uh, at Andersley here on Twitter, Dursley1 Instagram, and Andy and I actually have an event coming up on February 12th. We're going to And do an and. That's right. <laughs> Ampersand squared. Uh, we're going to do a Twitch sort of discussion about our shared alma mater, uh, The New School. It's going to be about uh, the, the the working title is the new school a radical vision betrayed. How did it go astray from its uh, from its communistic roots? Um, I, Luisa Diaz and and some other cool people who went to the new school are going to be on there as well. It's at seven seven on February twelfth. I love it, Andy. You got anything? Uh, you can listen to the Antifada. Our last episode is with Hardcrackers Journal. I'm very proud of that one. And, uh, yeah, please uh, check out Woodbine. Check out our – we made, like, a little documentary recently that shows the work that we do. And please send us a little donation um, because, uh, yeah, we want to keep paying rent until rent doesn't exist anymore. Cool. And if you are a fan of our show, you can uh, sign up for our Patreon to give a donation to us. That was a gauche to step on your plug like that. Um, <laughs> you guys know. You know the show. Patreon.com slash America. We have m- new merch. I have some new uh, stickers and T-shirts that have the logo that you will see updated on your phone as of right now. On them at uh, poddamnamerica.bigcartel.com. And my other show is Why You Mad. I think that's it. Okay. Mutual aid. Or not, not mutual aid. All right, uh, that's it. Thanks, guys. It's finished. Thank you. It's finished.